I'm Michael Murphy, and in the previous programme on Wagner's music in Ireland, we heard how the music of the great German was initially greeted in Ireland with a degree of suspicion, if not total disdain. For minutes together we have strains not only quite meaningless and noisy, but discordant and offensive. But over time, the Irish public warmed to his music, and some even wallowed in it to excess. It has astounded me. It has entranced me. Yet I cannot tell how or why it has done this. And by the turn of the 20th century, Wagner's music had taken a firm hold in Ireland. In this programme, we'll trace the progress of Wagner's music in Ireland from the early 1900s up to the present time. That was the opening of Act Two of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde, with Fergus Scheele conducting the National Symphony Orchestra of Ireland in the wide open opera production given in 2012 in Dublin. We'll hear more about that and other Wagner performances in Ireland later in the programme. But I want to start with the question of Wagner's influence on Irish composers. When we think of Wagner, we think of opera. So we might well start with those who composed operatic or dramatic works in the late 19th century. One significant figure at the time was James Cooksey Culwick, whose legacy persists in the prodigious Culwick Choral Society. His dramatic cantata, The Legend of Stauffenberg, was composed in 1890 and contains a Wagnerian-inspired libretto written by the Irish playwright John Todhunter. Another example is Esposito's one-act opera, the Tinker and the Fairy of 1903. The libretto was written by W.B. Yeats and the music blended elements of Irish folk music with a Wagnerian harmonic language. Another obscurity is an opera by one William Harvey Pellessier, as Dr. Axel Klein explains. A different case is probably that very unknown opera, Conla of the Golden Hair by William Harvey Pellissier, who was a composer from, born in Clonmel, and she was a kind of part-time composer. He didn't, she never wrote any, any major work apart from this particular work and one other cantata, but apart from that he's not very, he didn't become very well known. And that opera actually was performed in 1902, uh, in connection with the uh, Feschiola of that year. And the Wagnerian influence there is comes in the form of light motifs, which was this idea of, of Wagner to connect a, a person with a certain musical motif, a melodic motif mostly. And Harvey uh, Pellissier, I think, devised some 16 or 18 uh, different light motifs, which is a strange idea because the basic idea or the core idea of uh, a light motif is that you can actually recognize the, the tune easily and, and then bring it into connection with a certain person. But with 18 such light motifs, you can never recognize it after the first hearing. Unfortunately, we have no recording of Pellissier's, Colwick's, or Esposito's works. Most of them received one or two performances in their day before being consigned to the doldrums of Irish music history. Perhaps the most Wagnerian Irish opera, if you'll excuse the term, was composed by Robert O'Dwyer, who was born in Bristol to Irish parents and who later came to Ireland where he immersed himself in the Gaelic League. His two-act opera, Ethna, was regarded by many commentators at the time as Wagnerian. The story of Ethna features a magic sword, a magic ring, a dragon, and a magic bird that speaks to the king in a forest scene. It's an ancient Irish myth, uh, set in a, in a very primordial world, and, uh, and, and I suppose that would align very much with a lot of what Va Wagner wanted in his operas, as you think of the Ring Cycle. This is Gavin Ring, a singer and scholar at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, who is researching some of these obscure Irish operas, including Robert O'Dwyer's Ethna. The piece itself is is a very elaborate expression, significant expression of the Gaelic revival, and that idea of Irish artistic expression being beyond, as Thomas Bartlett has said, the shameless shamrockery of uh, rep representations of Irish culture. 
but it is also a cosmopolitan expression of that identity. And uh, you know, one could not think of a more cosmopolitan expression than opera, and in particular, uh, an opera that is, you know, so so very clearly uh, influenced by Wagnerian principles. Another Irish composer, Hamilton Harty, was born in County Down and moved to London in 1900, where he married the soprano Agnes Nichols. Harty was deeply influenced by Esposito, and as Professor Jeremy Dibble explains, we can find Wagnerian influences in his Ode to a Nightingale for soprano and orchestra. Harty wrote a work for Agnes Nichols in 1907 for the Cardiff Festival, basically a setting of John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. And I'm absolutely positive he chose this text because it contains so many of those things that are representative of Schopenhauer and Tristan. The idea of coming out of oneself, the idea of music being, um, being able to express something of the other, um, of something near death. And undoubtedly um, Keats's Ode uh, has many of these ideas reflected in it and in many ways it was Harty's own Liebestod for his wife. That was soprano Heather Harper singing with the Ulster Orchestra, conducted by Bryden Thompson, performing Harty's Ode to a Nightingale. If Harty was an Irish composer setting the work of a famous English poet, we can instance a famous English composer, Vaughan Williams, basing his opera on the work of an Irish dramatist. John Millington sings Riders to the Sea. For Professor Harry White of the UCD School of Music, Singh's output represents a prime example of the deep connection between music and literature in Ireland. He thinks of all of his plays as a species of opera, which is why Ray Vaughan Williams set Riders to the Sea and hardly altered a word of the original play when it came to the libretto. So that the relationship between what you hear in Ray Vaughan Williams' opera and what you hear in Singh's play is incredibly intimate. And that's because uh, of Singh's own background in music, but also because of his absorption of literary Wagnerism. Literary Wagnerism. The term itself captures the close connection between music and words. In Ireland, music and literature have been intimately related to such a degree that Harry White coined the memorable phrase, music is the sovereign ghost of the Irish literary imagination. But what sort of ghost was Wagner for Irish writers? Well, I think Wagner was a formative ghost, a haunting spirit for Irish writers who were born anywhere between the mid-1850s and the early 1880s. And I'm thinking particularly of of Bernard Shaw, uh, who is an exemplary in instance of somebody whose whole imagination as a writer is shaped by Richard Wagner, but also of James Joyce, of course, and to 
a lesser extent or a more indirect extent, John Millington Singh. That doesn't exhaust the, the number of writers who are influenced by Wagner, but in terms of Irish writing, I think that that trio really relies on Wagner as a formative and shaping presence. And given that both Shaw and Joyce uh, explicitly considered careers in music, and of course, Singh went to Germany to train as a musician, the impact that Wagner has is more than indirect. Shaw was, of course, a prominent music critic, whose deep knowledge of music had its foundations in his Dublin childhood. Music, and particularly opera, permeates just about every strand of his career. Shaw's entire uh, vision for the theatre is predicated on the idea that Wagner has exhausted what Shaw describes as the drama of feeling in his music dramas. Shaw is a great student of German music in his early years, a great music critic, very ebullient, sometimes rather brash and even hostile one. But he takes it as given that Wagner completes the mental journey embarked upon by Beethoven, insofar as Wagner supplies the words, as it were, to Beethoven's gestures and structures. And so when he begins to think of himself as an artist, he comes to the conclusion very quickly that Wagner has done everything that can be done with the drama of feeling and that it is his job, Bernard Shaw's job, to reinvent the British theatre by embarking upon a drama of ideas. However, when Shaw becomes most engaged with music as a paradigm, it is in the third act of Man and Superman, a play which dates from 1903. And in that play and in the third act, three of the characters from the play partake of a kind of dream sequence in which they're talking to the devil and the devil is describing to them the idea of music and the idea of opera particularly as being the brandy of the damned and he's regretting bitterly the fact that that humankind and european culture generally seems to have moved beyond wagner in favor of nietzsche and in favor of the superman and in favor of a europe that doesn't require the sustenance and nourishment of music the the more general sense of european culture having run out of opera after Wagner is very pronounced in this play. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche was an erstwhile friend of Wagner and devotee of his music, but subsequently became disenchanted with both. In this extract from Act 3 of Shaw's Man and Superman, the devil tells the statue about this separation. Oh, it was not about music. Wagner once drifted into life force worship and invented a superman called Siegfried. But he came to his senses afterwards. So when they met here, Nietzsche denounced him as a renegade and Wagner wrote a pamphlet to prove that Nietzsche was a Jew. And it ended in Nietzsche's going to heaven in a huff. And good riddance too. was the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland 
conducted by Alexander Anisimov, with Daniel Lewis Williams in the part of Hagen calling the vassals to arms in Act II of Goethe Demerung. The writer George Moore was a confirmed Irish Wagnerite, as is obvious from his novels and critical writings. What I find most interesting about Moore is that his personal life is coloured by Wagnerian ideas, and we can see this quite clearly in his many letters to Maud Burke, who was, of course, Lady Cunard, with whom he had a lifelong affair. When Moore addressed Burke as Dearest Freya, he was invoking the goddess of the golden apples in the ring. One of his favourite Wagnerian scenes was Act 1, Scene 3 of Die Valkyra, where Sieglinde and Siegmund converse in secret. Moore admired how Wagner portrayed womanhood in the form of Sieglinde in this scene how the music expresses her humiliation at her forced marriage, her desire for revenge, her longing for a hero who would draw the sword from the ash tree and thereby free her from her misery. In this recording from 1940, we hear the great Lotte Lehmann in the part of Sieglinde with the orchestra of the Metropolitan Opera conducted by Eric Leinsdorf. <laughs> response to this musical portrait of womanhood was I said to myself with some bitterness Wagner has done more in five minutes than I have done in 365 pages if Moore was in awe of Wagner and felt unable to match his achievement James Joyce was more guarded in his response to Wagner but given the monumental nature of both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake Joyce surely felt that he was his equal at a performance of Die Valkyrie and he turned to a friend according to his great biographer Richard Allman and said, don't you prefer my sirens to this music? And when the friend modestly demurred, Joyce walked away because as Allman said, he preferred to be a first Joyce than a second Wagner. Inspiration is nothing if it does not move an artist to originality. 
to create something new from existing materials, sometimes in the most unconventional and uncanny way. If Wagner's achievement is reflected anywhere in Irish culture, it is surely in Joyce's towering presence. There is no doubt that Ulysses is a work that is saturated with operatic models that are in some regard antithetical to Wagner. So there is a certain hostility to Wagner in but by the time Joyce starts to write Finnegan's Wake, there is no doubt that his debt to Wagner is enormous and that there is a relationship, as the Joyce scholar Timothy Martin has put it, between the four books of The Wake and the four music dramas of The Ring. And it's fair to argue, I think, that Joyce thereby becomes one of the most important students of Wagner in the uh, modern period. In Joyce's case, reference to Wagner does not necessarily mean reverence for Wagner. In this recording of Joyce's own recitation from Finnegan's Wake, we hear words and sounds that remind me of Das Rheingold. The Liffey runs through Joyce's Wake as the Rhine runs through Wagner's Ring. Joyce's melodious voice catches the coiling current of the river as it passes the washerwomen on its banks, reminiscent of the ageless Norns. The motion of the river is that of the narrative, the telling of tales, and in Joyce's tale we hear many echoes of Wagner's Rheingold. The tittering daughters bring to mind the frolicking Rhine maidens. The calls of ho and hey recur also in the ring. The elm tree recalls the ash tree, and the mention of night, so mysterious in Joyce's recitation, puts us in mind of Alberich, who emerges from the darkness of Nibelheim, which he himself calls night. These allusions are not the meaning of the extract, but they are part of its texture. Oh, Lord, twins of his bosom, Lord, save us. And ho, hey, for all men, what his tittering daughters of, walk, and here with the waters of, the chittering waters of, flittering bats, field mice, balk, talk, ho, are you not gone a home? What Tom Malone can't hear the bark of bats all the lifting waters of? Oh, talk, save us. My goose won't. I feel as old as yonder elm. A tale told of Sean of Shem, all Livia's daughter's son. Dark hawks hear us. My whole head falls. I feel as heavy as yonder stone. Tell me of Sean, of Sean. Who were Shem and Sean, the living sons and daughters of? Night now. Tell me, tell me, tell me, Elm. Night, night. Tell me tale of stem of stone beside the rivering waters of.
That was the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland in their 2002 production of The Ring Cycle, conducted by Alexander Anisimov. The Rhine Maidens were sung by Franzita Whelan, Imur McGilloway and Colette McGahan, and the part of Alberic was sung by Rolf Haunstein. While Wagner's influence on Irish writers waned after the First World War, Irish audiences had various opportunities to enjoy his music from time to time, with around 20 productions of Wagner's operas from the 1930s up to 2012. As writer and broadcaster Ian Fox recalls, we have the Dublin Grand Opera Society to thank for many of these productions. The, the first DGOS one was uh, Flying Dutchman back in 1946, um, and then it was the Tristan in the early 50s, and then in 56, I think it was, uh, the Essen Municipal Opera came to Dublin. The DGOS brought them in, using the, obviously using the, the Radio Air and Orchestra, um, and they did a Valkyra in 56. I didn't see it, but I know people who did see it, a little bit older than I am, even me, uh, and um, they said it was actually very good and very enjoyable indeed, but houses weren't great. So, therefore, they, we didn't get much Wagner, but they did, they did a Tannhäuser, which also to be Paul conducted. Uh, they did a Flying Dutchman in the 60s as well. And then when Anavazzi came in as their chief conductor, but both conductor and as, as organiser of the seasons, he gave us a Lohengrin, uh, a 71 I think it was, and then a Tannhäuser late, later on. In those days, and certainly up to up to this recent times, uh, Wagner didn't sell. So the DGS would have liked to have done more, more Wagner, but it didn't really sell. German opera wasn't popular. The, the, the DGS audience, which is very much a kind of a Dublin 4 audience, wanted the Italians and a little bit of Mozart occasionally, but not too much. extract, we heard the Dublin Grand Opera Society's 2001 production of The Flying Dutchman, with Laurent Wagner conducting the RTE Concert Orchestra and Johannes van Duisburg as the Dutchman. Early in the 20th century, we had to rely mainly on the Carl Rosa Company for performances of Wagner's operas, but it made no attempt at taking on the daunting task of staging the ring cycle. Charles Manners first proposed a ring in 1905, and then the Ernst Denhoff Opera Company made an attempt in 1910, but both of these proposals came to nothing. However, success was born in 1913, the centenary of the composer's birth. A centenary is sometimes said to be an occasion for taking a worthy out of his glass case, dusting him and putting him back. But Wagner is not yet in the glass case. Not only are the principles he advocated the principles on which music today is based, but his own work is more frequently represented in orchestral programs today than that of any orchestral composer. So said the Irish Times in February 1913 in an article solemnly entitled Wagner Centenary, Observance in Dublin. As Ita Bosang explains, the centenary was marked by the first ever production in Ireland of The Ring. It was in the Theatre Royal and it was the Quinlan Opera Company who gave the first performance of The Ring in Ireland, but it was in English. 
But the Quinlan Opera Company had dipped their toe in the water the year before that, in 1912, when they performed Siegfried. And they got such a good response that by 1913, Thomas Quinlan, who was an impresario, an amazing impresario, had decided that he was going to perform the ring with his company in nine English-speaking countries and he started with Ireland that was in May 1913 from the 12th to the 16th of May and the coverage on the newspapers it's not a bit like nowadays when you, there's just a short review whole columns of uh, information were given in all the newspapers with a synopsis of the plot and of course the reviews Thomas Quinlan had an orchestra of uh, 60 and a chorus of 75 and I think altogether there were 173 members of his cast so it was a huge operation. Last night's performance given before a large and brilliant audience was completely successful. For two and a half hours without a break the piece held the keen attention of the assembly. There was every indication that this production of The Ring, for the first time in Dublin, will be a memorable affair for all who are privileged to witness it. Yet, perhaps some who were there feel a certain sense of disappointment in witnessing the stage production of Wagner's great work. The poem and the music stimulate the imagination to conceptions with which no efforts of stage mechanism can compete. Nearly a century passed before Ireland witnessed another full ring cycle. It happened in early August 2002, in the University Concert Hall in Limerick, and the driving force behind the project was Joanna Crooks, who was General Manager of the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland. In collaboration with Opera Ireland, and featuring a host of national and international singers, the cycle was conducted by Alexander Anisimov. Alexander Anisimov was chief conductor of the RT National Symphony Orchestra at the time and he was keen to do a ring because he wanted to do a ring back in, in uh, Kiev in the Ukraine in the following years. So he was pushing to do it. He was also doing guest conducting with the youth orchestra and I think those people involved in the orchestra at that time were very keen and, and you always need somebody to say, let's do it and see what, will it happen or will it work and they were de dead keen to do it. This extract from the final scene of the Valkyra features Frode Olsen as Wotan and Janice Baird as Brunhilde. Wotan will put his daughter into a deep sleep and, at her insistence, protect her with a ring of magic fire until a hero comes to wake her.
sing is quite a task for any orchestra to undertake, and particularly for the members of a youth orchestra. I was first contacted by the Irish Youth Orchestra to say that they were undertaking this project. And uh, um, I mean, my first thought was, well, that is extraordinarily ambitious. And I have to admit, I wondered how they would pull it off. This is Professor Christopher Morris of NUI Maynooth. Of course you want to challenge a youth orchestra, but this is rather like saying to a, a mountain climber, you know, let's go to the Himalayas now and, and, and see how you handle those. The amount of music that, um, that these young players had to rehearse, the stamina, again, you, you're asking them to perform for, for durations that they wouldn't normally encounter. Well, they, they did pull it off. Um, they gave extraordinarily committed and really polished performances. So it's a great credit to, to them, to the whole, to the whole organisation, um, to the effectiveness of the rehearsal process. The Limerick production avoided the enormous problem of sets and costumes by staging the ring as a concert performance. Ian Fox again. We all have huge differences of opinions about what the productions of Wagner should be, traditional, modern, whatever. In this case, of course, it was a concert performance, but it was more than a concert performance. First of all, the orchestra was on the stage of the concert hall, so you got a wonderful sound. It's great to have the orchestra right up there so you can hear the wonderful score. They left a big stretch free at the front of the orchestra. Singers were allowed to wander around that. Semi they wore black gear, black slacks and black shirts or a black dress. So all no costumes. A few, very few key uh, props were used. But they also had music stands around. So they could either put their score on the music stand and work there. Or they could ignore the music stand and wander around with the score in their hands. Or in some cases they didn't need the score and they just sang uh, as it was. So there's some little bit of acting got involved. And because the pace is so slow in Wagner, it is difficult to fill all those bits in. But because of this system, it worked awfully well. And Dieter Kegi, who was involved, of course, in the uh, Opera Ireland, did the production of it. And he did some quite clever things. He put some of the characters up in the balconies and so on to create different spatial effects and so on but it was a wonderful way to see it I think it's the best way to see the ring cycle because you haven't to worry about dragons and magic fire and, all, and people vanishing and all that rubbish you can listen to the musical side of it and really enjoy the fantastic score that it is and it's a wonderful way to see the opera so I think it was it scored all kinds of points uh, in, in the whole cycle and it was really marvellous to see The critical acclaim was universal and remarkably once they had finished in Limerick the entire company set off for Birmingham where they repeated the whole thing a few days later. At least they didn't have to worry about transporting costumes and sets, not to mention the dragon. And of course, Siegfried, sung here by Alan Woodrow, had to forge his magic sword again, as we will hear in this extract from Act One of Siegfried. This is wonderful playing from the orchestra and full-throated singing from Woodrow, who bellows out his forging song and boasts of felling the ash tree as he hammers the sword no tongue into shape. Oh, 
Running concurrently with the was an international conference entitled Wagner and Wagnerism, Contexts, Connections, Controversies. And it attracted some of the most distinguished Wagner scholars in the world, John Dethridge, Dieter Borschmeier, and Nika Wagner, the great granddaughter of the composer. Needless to say, the vexed question of Wagner's anti-Semitism and the subsequent canonization of Wagner by the Nazis caused debate among the speakers and audience. Christopher Morris again. So we are very pleased to be joined at the symposium by Nika Wagner, who is the daughter of uh, Wieland Wagner, one of the two brothers, um, uh, Wieland and Wolfgang, who ran Bayreuth um, after the, the death of Siegfried Wagner, who's the son of the composer. Shortly after the symposium, Gottfried Wagner uh, also uh, joined us. He is the son of uh, Wolfgang Wagner and uh, he came to speak at UL and UCC, gave very interesting talks and what's I suppose unique about his position is he is a Wagner but he speaks against the Wagner family. Um, he's uh, very critical of the whole Bayreuth legacy. He feels that um, the Wagner family has never properly come to terms with its tainted past, you know, its associations during the Third Reich with, with the Nazi hierarchy. And so um, the, the talk he gave in Ireland was was on this 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 tainted legacy and quite how the Wagner family has uh, in his view managed to avoid coming to terms uh, with its associations um, and has more or less swept that under the carpet and he views it as his role to make sure that that past isn't buried um, isn't isn't swept under the under the rug Anxiety and admiration sit alongside each other in the Wagnerian world. And in the days after the Limerick Wagner Festival, the Wagner Society of Ireland came into being with Anisimov elected president. If the proposal by the National Youth Orchestra of Ireland to stage a ring had raised eyebrows in 2002, a decade later, conductor Fergus Scheel caused another kerfuffle when he announced that he was to found a new opera company whose first production would be Tristan and Isolde. Despite the prevailing economic circumstances in the post-Celtic Tiger years, Fergus was able to raise the necessary funding. You know, the context of it was that Opera Ireland had closed down and there was funding available for opera. And I think the Arts Council were keen that in the absence of Opera Ireland that there still would be main-scale opera available in the country. So they had a certain amount of money available. We pitched for it and we got it. And, you know, I think, yeah, why Tristan? People can't believe, you know, you start an opera company and you do Tristan within six months. Um, it, it's something that people spent years planning to do. But um, in a way, it didn't drop out of the sky. I had planned it. I had thought about it. I had a lot of the cast in mind. Um, so, you know, we were able to hit the ground running once we got the green light from the, from the Arts Council. His decision to perform Tristan and Isolde was informed by the obvious Irish connection between that opera and Irish mythology. I've worked on Tristan and Isolde myself as an assistant twice in Scotland and in Australia. So I know the music incredibly well. I've worked over a period of 15 years since I first started studying the score. And uh, it's been burning away inside me as something that I always wanted to present to Ireland because the character of Isolde in the opera is Irish, because we have a fantastic singer, Miriam Murphy, who can sing that role on an absolutely world level. So, you know, this, this was just something that was waiting to happen and I had actually <laughs> I look back through my old files and my computer and everything I had several sort of plans afoot over the years to actually do it finally it came together in 2012 In Wagner's opera Isolde is an archetypal femme fatale to become ensnared by her magic charms is to invite certain death but who was Isolde before she was immortalised by Wagner There are still places in Dublin associated with her 
and one of them is at the west end of Dublin's Temple Bar, where I met Dr. Mark Fitzgerald of the DIT Conservatory of Music and Drama. And this is where we'll find the remains of one of the old towers that was part of the medieval walls of Dublin. And this was known as the Soldus Tower. But as Mark explains, separating history from mythology is all but impossible. Well, Isolde is believed to have been uh, an Irish princess. Uh, there are various different versions of the legend which all give her different fathers, various different kings and so on. It's all very unclear as to who exactly she's meant to be. And various parts of the city are associated with her. So in some versions of the legend we have the encounter between Tristan and Isolde taking place in Dublin, in this sort of area of Dublin, the medieval area of Dublin. And then other parts of the city at various times acquired names associated with Isolde. So, for example, uh, just if you move further up the Liffey, uh, you come to the Phoenix Park. And at one point, there was an area there known as Isolde's Hill. And there was another area within the park where there was a great hawthorn tree and beside it there was what was known as the Soldus Font. It's very unclear today as to what exactly this was, but it's another of these areas that had that sort of association. Today, a lot of people would immediately think of Chapel Izzard uh, as an area which is associated with the Solda. Some people would say that the name comes from uh, the Irish for Chapel Isolde, as in the Chapel of Isolde. And there are various references to a chapel with a name like Isolde Isolde or other variants like that. So you have a number of these different urban legends which have grown up to say that this was where uh, she lived, this is where she met Tristan. There's even one version which says this is where she married Tristan. Uh, so rather different to what happens in uh, Wagner's opera. Um, however, it is possible that all of these are completely false and that in fact the area may come from some other sort of derivation of Irish, such as uh, Shepel on Desert, to indicate that this was a very isolated spot at one stage. Or it may have been actually called after uh, a Lazar or leper hospital in the area. So it may have no connection with Isolde whatsoever. Wagner's Tristan and Isolde had occasionally been performed in Ireland before the 2012 production. Ian Fox again. Tibor Paul was then conductor of the then Radio Air and Symphony Orchestra and he ran a wonderful music festival in 1963 here in Dublin but a part of that festival was a Tristan and that was staged in the Gaiety Theatre as part of that year's Dublin Grand Opera Society season but it was a joint venture because of, of Paul's involvement. As it turned out, we had to wait almost 50 years for the next production of Tristan. Fergus Scheel used the Welsh National Opera production which allows the story to unfold in an uncomplicated manner. I knew when I was conducting it and preparing it, I knew that I could start at bar one and get to the last bar. You know, so actually conducting it was not the problem, but actually what do you do with that, you know, in between bar one and bar the alpha and the omega? What do you do in there? And that, that was the challenge. And that's where my own sort of, um, as I was preparing for it, you know, I, I was really questioning myself, do I really know what's happening here, you know, and where we're going? So I did, I did some unusual things that I've never done in preparing any other score. I took a huge big long piece of paper about 20 feet long and I sort of mapped out the whole opera. I drew a picture of the opera on this piece of paper so I had act one, I had act two and I had act three and then I just kind of drew a little graph like you'd see almost like a medical graph of going up and down of where was the emotional trajectory, you know, where were the peaks and the troughs and then I looked at that and you could see you know, very simply that uh, act two essentially has the, the excitement and the, uh, of the beginning and then the meeting of Tristan and Isolde and it's incredibly passionate and then it just dips right down into this beautiful, tranquil love duet and then it, it revs back up again for towards the end as the, the duet gets very intense and more and more builds and builds and builds and then King Mark comes in, you know, and it's like a, an emotional guillotine when that happens.
That was Miriam Murphy and Lars Cleveman in the love duet from Act Two of Tristan and Isolde with the National Symphony Orchestra of Ireland conducted by Fergus Scheel. And at the end of that extract we heard Brett Polligato as Curvenal famously interrupting the lovers and urging Tristan to save himself as King Mark was just about to arrive on the scene. The cast also included some of Ireland's most accomplished singers Imelda Drum as Brangaina, Paul as the sailor, Gavin Steers, Eugene Ginty as Melot, and Owen Gilhooley in the part of the shepherd. In these two programmes, we've traced the progress of Wagner's music from the 1860s onwards. While there have been a number of great Wagnerian moments, Ireland seems to be behind the rest of the world when it comes to including Wagner's music and concert repertoire. In 1912, Arnold Bax expressed his surprise at the relative lack of Wagner's music in Dublin, and a full century later, Michael Durvin in the Irish Times lamented that same scarcity and its detrimental effect on music education. For years now, I haven't been able to get out of my head the idea that composers growing up in Ireland are effectively being deprived of an essential element of their education. A visceral contact with some of the most extravagant or, if you prefer, outlandish aspirations that any composer of the highest genius ever brought to fulfilment. The music can be extravagant and outlandish, and so too were some of the reactions to it. But George Bernard Shaw was right, I think, when he claimed that Wagner's music was perfectly single and simple. His exact words were, the unskilled, untaught musician may approach Wagner boldly, for there is no possibility of misunderstanding between them. Like Shaw, Wagner was a man of the theatre, and it's well nigh impossible to misunderstand the dramatic nature of his music at any given moment. Hate is hate. Love is love. Tragedy is tragedy. And while Wagner's music continues to raise many moral questions that cannot be ignored, I doubt if it would cause so much controversy if Wagner wasn't a composer of the highest genius. (laughs) 